Welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday YouTube channel. I am your host, Ryan Hartley. This channel is for heart-centered leaders just like you. I hope our time spent together helps you leave a heart print where those around you are left better than yesterday. These interview sessions are sponsored by our great friends at Elevate Online Marketing. Here we go, first interview session of 2023. It is episode 204 with Tommy Hatto. Tommy is an award-winning well-being coach, motivational speaker, actor, model, and he is the founder of Tommy Hatto Online, a well-being coaching and consulting company with a combined social media presence of over 100,000 followers and winning the Mental Health Blog Award for Social Media Champion in 2022. Tommy hopes to use his platforms to engage with people and businesses to share his story that being perfect isn't all it's perceived to be. Tommy has experience in supporting issues such as imposter syndrome, self-esteem, eating disorders and body image. Through working closely with some of the world's top experts in fitness, nutrition, life coaching and dermatology, Tommy uses his knowledge and his personal experience to transform well-being strategies for organizations as well as individuals, which has decreased employee turnover. We have a wonderful conversation about Tommy's career, about uh, being in Hollywood and all the things that that has done for his own heart his mind, and his well-being. I hope that you enjoy episode 204, and I hope that it encourages you to invest in your well-being. The core message I would love for you to take away is that when you give to yourself first, you become better for those who need you. Here we go, episode 204 with Tommy Hatto. Tommy, welcome to the Always Best in Yesterday podcast. How are you? I'm good, thank you, Ryan. How are you? Really good to see you. Yes, very good, mate. And um, thank you for being flexible. We rearranged and I think there's uh, there's something I trust about the universe that we are uh, going to have the right conversation at the right time. Yeah, definitely. So you you live up the road. Tell me about what it was like growing up in Swindon. Yeah, um, you know, Swindon gets a bad rap, <laughs> but I, I don't mind it. Um, I don't mind it because... Of convenience it's it's nice I, i'm a big nature guy and around in the surrounding areas is a lot of stuff you know there's lakes there's great walks um and for work it's convenient um you know you go on the m4 down to london it takes me just over an hour to drive get the train and you know i'm in bristol quite often so yeah i i like swinging and growing up um it was fine i mean it was it was difficult in a way in terms of my upbringing and in terms of identity mm -hmm. um, so you know my my mother's from thailand my father is british and growing up there just wasn't any kids that looked like me mm -hmm. um, which was a struggle in itself because they you know there were ethnic people there were people of different cultures mm -hmm. but none who i could relate to there was nobody of sort of a southeast asian origin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or partly um, and when I told people like, man, I'm from Thailand, everybody was like, where is that? Um, <laughs> and wow, you are like a jungle kid and things like that. And, you know, I, I had worse names caught than that. But um, yeah, it was, it wasn't too bad. I mean, it just, uh, yeah, you know, it was a s small town at the time. And uh, yeah, it was just, uh, just trying to find my feet in terms of who I was and my identity and where I fitted in. And that was schooling, late 90s, early 2000s? Uh, yes, that's right, yeah. It's amazing how much the world has both changed and yet not changed in, in that amount of time. Do you know what? It's funny because I say, you know, at that time when I was, you know, what it was like early 2000s, mid 2000s, and everyone was like, where is Thailand? And those same people who I've grown up with and then, We've now kind of left school or left college, and I see them on social media, and they're like, they're now traveling time. Yeah, like, right. Okay, right. now you know where it is. Now you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh dear, it's a funny old world. So how how do you find that that's um is that something that's kind of 
uh, grown in you in terms of this identity piece? Is, is it something that, that stuck with you throughout childhood? Is it something that you revisited later in life? How, what, what's the story? Definitely revisited. I think, you know, my my first language was Thai. Um, mm-hmm. I went to kindergarten in Thailand, mm-hmm. came back to England, and, you know, I really struggled to pick up English. Um, you know, I had to have sort of a teaching assistant in school with me just to make sure because I was behind all the other kids in school Um, and it was you know I did experience racism in school like I said and you know I don't think it was anything malicious or intended it was just people didn't know where this you know this place was and um, you know it was very alien to them and then all of the comments that came from that Mm -hmm. and the effect that that had on me was really huge because all of a sudden I didn't want to identify as anything other than being white British Um, that I just wanted to fit in you know because I I was already sort of behind everybody at school I didn't want I just wanted to fit in at school I just wanted to be normal like everybody else so I disassociated myself with that part of my identity and I stopped speaking Thai I didn't want anything to do with Thailand. If my if my mum would speak to me in Thai, I'd reply to her in English. Um, and all because I didn't want to face any of the negativity that was thrown at me. And I didn't want to be felt any different to other people at school. And that stuck with me for a very, very long time. Um, until maybe about five or six years ago and it wasn't until I actually started when I started working and I was traveling and traveling a lot and I found myself back in Asia I was working I was filming a movie at the time and I was uh, working on some modeling campaigns and then just living in there it felt very natural to me and I remember being in Bangkok and you know, I was in, I was living in Tokyo as well, um, but being in that part of the world, and I was like, this is who I am. It, mm. This feels natural to me. Mm. And then I got a complex where like, okay, well, I, I am part Thai and I'm living in Thailand. But I can't speak Thai um, because I had forgotten it because I had just stopped speaking it. And then I, I made a more conscious effort to start learning it again and start yeah. integrating myself within the culture because it felt like home to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and now when I do sort of the advocacy on well-being and I do the advocacy on diversity at the forefront of everything that I do, I make a point to talk about who I am and what my identity is. And I want people to know that I am proud to be British, but I'm also proud to be Thai. That is running through my blood. Mm. And I also feel a sense of duty in a way that there are communities in that part of the world yeah. who look up to me or you know, they'll be able to see me representing us as a community, them as a country, um, because I do have a, a public platform as such. And I do feel a bit of service that I need to represent our community out there. Yeah. It still was a risk, isn't it? You know, a good friend of mine and a good friend of our community, Layla, she is a third generation Moroccan, mm. British Moroccan. So she's, um, and she, you know, when I speak to her, she, and, and I try and understand what it's like, you know, because I'll never really truly understand. And, and she says, I, I don't feel like I belong anywhere. It's like I'm not truly accepted in in British because clearly I physically look different. And yet I have no understanding of what it's like to live in a Moroccan heritage. Or yet my skin feels like it because I need some warmth and some sunshine. But she's, you know, and and the risk there is that you you get to a point where you don't truly feel like you belong anywhere. Do do you know what? I was was in London last night. I was seeing a friend. He's a a film journalist. He came from Toronto and we had dinner. And I was saying this exact conversation with him. And I was, and we were talking about the industry and I was saying sort of, you know, I I now try to make a point of my identity because Mm -hmm. at the time when I was working, I wanted, I didn't feel like I knew what my identity was, but also... I felt as though I had to be ethnically ambiguous um, because that's how people had perceived me. You know, if I had met 
new people and they would ask I used to play a game with people when people would be like oh where's your heritage and I would always say well okay have a guess and I swear to you every single person I asked each answer was completely different that nobody could really pinpoint what sort of my background was and they had chosen probably every continent um maybe bar africa um that that you could think of and i was saying you know it was in a way it's a blessing and a curse because it's good to be ethnically ambiguous because i felt as though i could gravitate into different uh groups and communities as such that when i was going for acting roles that i could you know i when i was living in um la i was going for a lot of sort of hispanic latin looking characters because i could portray those characters um and that was a blessing as such because i felt a part of every community that no matter where i go i could almost feel a part of it but on the other side of that I was never authentically a part of those. So although I felt like I could be a part of them, I was never 100% in it. And then to your point, I just never felt like I had a community myself. Yeah. So it, it was a very interesting, introspective kind of look at it. Um, so, you know, there's, there's pros and cons. I want to get to this concept of identity, particularly since you've spent time with, you know, the rich, the famous, the celebrities, the models, and I really want to know what you've learned around identity from that perspective. But, but uh, let's understand how you got there. And and what does Dustin Hoffman have to do with any of it? <laughs> yeah, this is, I mean, he's, this is what, when I do all the media interviews, this is everything. This is like, you got discovered by Dustin Hoffman and, you know, Dustin Hoffman saw something in you and two, you know, to be fair, he did. Um, I I studied very hard in school, um, got okay grades, um, and I wanted to pursue a career in marine biology. That's I love the ocean. Sharks are my favorite animals, and that's where what the career I wanted to pursue was. Um, but I didn't really want to study anymore, um, and to go it down to that route. I had to go to university. I thought, mm, I don't know about this. Um, my parents wanted me to go to university. I just didn't feel it. My heart, my gut was telling me, don't do it. So I didn't. Um, so my backup plan, I wanted to go into journalism. I love writing. Um, you know, I, I journal every day. I still journal now. I just, I love to write. So I thought, no, I'll, I'll put that into journalism and I'll do an internship. So I moved to London straight after school, um, got an internship with a film, entertainment, music, PR journalist company. And, you know, and it, I always think life works out in mysterious ways. So one of my colleagues at the time was supposed to go cover London Film Festival, but they were sick. Um, so I had to go in their place and we went down and Dustin Hoffman was premiering his new movie that he had directed um so we went watched the movie it was great um then there was a press conference afterwards we went into the press conference i was sat in the second or third row um literally bang in the middle and they were all on the stage in front of us and it mu- i think it must have been like 40 minutes into the press conference, somebody next to me had asked a question. Um, Dustin Hoffman answered it. And as he finished it, he he pointed and he was like, this, this guy has a face for camera. Somebody needs to get him on TV. And I was like, <laughs> me? <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and then, and, um, and then afterwards then, I just had some, because it was a, it was an industry conference, I had some casting directors come up to me mm. and they were like, hey, you know, what, you know, have you ever been interested in doing acting? And I was like, well, I did drama at school to build my confidence. And yeah, I, you know, for me, I'll always give anything a shot. So I was like, yeah, okay, why not? And they were like, okay, come to, there's an audition, the casting next week, come down to it. All you have to do is just read some lines. 
um, so you can get on. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Sounds good. I went to the, the casting studio the week after, read some lines. I was so nervous, by the way, because <laughs> um, I had never done anything like this before. Yeah. But I was like, okay, well, you know, Dustin Hoffman said I, I should be on camera. Maybe this is, maybe this is fate. Um, I read the lines and it was just for a very small bit part. Um, but that movie was for the second Thor movie. So then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I was I was on set and never been on a movie set before. And I was filming a Marvel movie. Now it was a it was a tiny part, um, but that was my first exposure into it. And I was like, do you know what? I could, yeah, I could get used to this life. And um, that's how it, that's kind of how it transpired. And, you know, I, I do owe Dustin for it. Not because, you know, I, I only met him briefly, but because of what transpired from there, because I then became known as the guy that was discovered by Dustin Hoffman and people wanted to take interest in that. So, you know, a lot of agencies approached me and uh, yeah, a couple of months later, I was, I was living in Hollywood. Was that like a bit different to Swindon? <laughs> a bit different to Swindon. <laughs> um, do you know what? It's funny. I always, I, I have this thing. I always follow my gut. My biggest advice to anybody is to follow your gut. Um, no matter what anybody tells you. Um, and you know, I have lost friends because of that advice they'll, they'll tell me things and I won't listen to them and they'll follow what I do and then you know they'll be like you didn't listen to me why did you ask me for the advice but I like I said I didn't go to university against my parents wishes um, they weren't best pleased but I felt at the time that's for me that wasn't what I wanted to do um, and when I said uh, okay and I said to my parents and I said to my friends okay I just got an opportunity to, to move to Los Angeles and start working as an actor. The first response was, you're not doing it. it you, you know, people like us don't get opportunities like this. And yeah, I mean, we, we had, we didn't fall out, but they weren't happy. And I wasn't happy that they didn't feel supportive, <laughs> but I get where they were coming from that, you know, this, these things are crazy, you know, to, to, if somebody said to me they've been spotted and they're going to go live, live in Hollywood and they're going to make it as an actor, I would think, God, you've you got to be kidding me. But these things happen. And, you know, I felt in my gut, it felt like the right decision to make. I'd never lived abroad on my own. Mm -hmm. And here I was moving to something like you said, Ryan, which is complete opposite of Swindon. Um, but I did it and I loved it. I I love living out there. It's totally my vibe. Um, I I don't get caught up in all of the the, the showbiz stuff. It's not me. I don't drink. Um, not really a party person. But I love the ocean. I love the beach. I love nature. Um, I love great weather, and that's everything that it provided to me. It, you know we were going hiking yeah. we were going surfing we were going swimming we were just being outside i'm really into health um so you know that kind of caters for that so i loved it it was tough it was tough trying to earn a living full time as an actor when you're running paycheck to paycheck you don't know when the next pay is coming in um but yeah it was you know for somebody who literally fresh out of school and you know, was like 20 years old. It, it was an experience I'll never forget. Hey, my friends, thank you for being with us so far. I hope you're enjoying the interview. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about our signature heart print coaching. Our heart print coaching is for you if you're ready to go all in on becoming a heart centered leader, ready to go all in on doing more of what you love, ready to see what you are capable of with support, guidance and accountability. You're ready to go on a rapid transformational journey that would change your life and others in as little as three months. Are you ready to show up with courage and share your gift with the world? Ready to start making an income and more impact by doing what you love? Ready to start leaving your legacy where those around you are left better than yesterday? In our Heartprint Signature Coaching, 
In our time together, I'll help you lead from your heart set. I'll help you develop other people and your team. I'll help you bring your heart work to the world. I'll help you start leaving a legacy and capturing examples of your impact. I will help you be someone you love, to do more of what you love, and to serve people that you love. It's an amazing opportunity for someone who's ready to go all in and be a heart-centered leader. I'll throw in loads of other bonuses, including your life languages profile, uh, access to our Master Heart and Mind membership, and even some Always Better Than Yesterday merchandise. Head to abty.co.uk forward slash coaching to find out more, and I look forward to connecting with you very soon. That's abty.co.uk forward slash coaching. Here we go. Back to the interview. Yeah, it's really powerful. I mean, I was going to ask you about, did you find yourself or did you lose yourself? Because I think, you know, there's a difference if we think about going to Thailand so much as that is about, you know, introspection and finding yourself in in, in some sort of way in, introspectively. Um, and then you kind of look at this Western culture where it's sometimes, you, you know, many people will go to these places and somewhat lose their self in 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 culture. So it's interesting to hear that that's your story. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, you know, when you're when you're in an environment where things are considered normal, so you know, when you're mm. when I was living out there and I was going to parties where literally money was no object and it was just throwing cash everywhere. And there were these really huge houses in Beverly Hills that I was going to. And you know, those parties that you see on television, those were the parties that I was going to. And it it can be so easy to get caught up in that type of lifestyle, you know, that, you know, you're seeing such lavish, expensive things, and then that is considered normal. Mm -hmm. And then you strive to be that. And, and for a while I did, I always felt as though I had to kind of show people, especially coming home, you know, when I would come visit home and kind of, you know, I always feel as though I had to show them, look at what my life is like now. Um, but then I would go and visit, you know, my family in Thailand who literally have nothing. They work on the rice fields and they're happy. And that always grounded me and always gave me that sense of perspective to say, well, actually, it isn't about those material things. It literally is about self-fulfillment and happiness. Yeah. And you use the words... Um these things don't happen for people like us and I, and I guess in you going you were then you were then having to redefine what it meant I guess in terms of your identity because here's here's one family identity saying that these opportunities don't come around for people like us so if that's where we take you know I, I think a lot about my family I think a lot about the way that we speak in our own family with our children and this sense of identity and here you were experiencing that being a something that you were breaking through and I guess going on your own to to craft and forge some some new forge of 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 who Tommy is or Tom yeah is. No, it it was exciting at the time and and don't get me wrong you know I think I I added a lot of pressure because of that right. and people were saying you know these this is just like a pie in the sky this is a cloud nine dream and here I was breaking through that barrier and showing, well, actually, you know, not only can people from, you know, places like Swindon, um, you know, no offense to that, but can do this, but also people of ethnic minorities, you know, can also do these things. And I felt a huge sense of pressure to carry and see that through. And I still, you know, I'm at a better place now, but I still feel sometimes like, God, there's so much that there's so much I could have done more. That, you know, if only I'd listened to that person, or if only I didn't disagree and not take that, or only if I went for that role, or only if I got that, because I feel as though I could have achieved a lot more and really started to make more, more ground, I guess, and really make a statement because I feel as though. You know, it's that imposter syndrome. Sometimes I feel like I'm I'm a bit of a failure. I went I went there and it didn't really work out because I didn't. Maybe it comes back to that whole material stuff that I didn't actually define success in mm. what I thought it was or what I feel as though I had to tell people it was. Um, 
so yeah that's it's it's a funny one yeah how did that um pressure of that industry take its toll what impact did it have on you i had a lot of body image issues from it i had a lot of um self-esteem crisis mm -hmm. i think you know my my story when i first got into it it really i always say it saved my life in a way because i didn't know anything about health and fitness or well-being or good nutrition i had suffered you know health issues at school i had an eating disorder because i didn't know what healthy was and here i was i was now working with you know really great trainers you know i have a trainer who i still occasionally work with her name is ramona um, you know, she got Hugh Jackman into shape. She's Zac Efron's personal trainer. Um, so she, she really taught me a lot about fitness. I worked with great nutritionists. I great, worked with great life coaches and dermatologists, uh, leadership coaches who really just transformed my body, my mind, and the way I think. Um, so it saved me because I had access to expert knowledge and resource. And it got me thinking myself as really confident and just in the best shape that I could be. But from being in that industry, I was constantly comparing myself yeah. to everybody. Um, when I would go to auditions, I would walk in, I would look at the, the competition um, mm -hmm. and I would think, man, I am not getting this. I'm not getting this wrong. Um, or I would go to modeling castings and I would look at somebody and I think, man, he, you know, he's six foot. He's got, he looks in better shape than me. He's got chiseled, mm -hmm. chiseled face. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get this. Um, and some, some days I wouldn't even go into the, the casting room. I'd walk into where all the other people were waiting. And I would walk straight out because I'd look and I think, I'm not putting myself through this. I'm not wasting my time here. And I'm not going to, Put myself through the embarrassment of being rejected because i had you know this industry is cutthroat and i had been rejected literally ten thousand times um and i thought no i'm, I'm going to save myself this so i was always comparing myself you know when i would go work out i was always thinking how can i how can i look like this person um when i would meet new people i would was always constantly thinking and what were they going to think of me? Because they had seen me in a magazine. They had seen me on TV. They had seen my modeling photographs. They had seen me on social media. And I always felt a sense that I had to live up to those expectations. So it really took its toll on my mind. And every time I met people, in the back of my head was always thinking, I wonder if they're disappointed that I don't look like that person. Or I wonder if they're, you know, I wonder if they think, wow, he, he's, he's much more photogenic, which is another thing, you know, what I always get a lot of people say, oh, you're really photogenic. And in the beginning, I used to take it as a compliment. But now some days I'm like, oh, does that mean I don't look as good as in person? <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, it really played on my mind and it made me very insecure about myself. Um, which only in the past couple of years have I truly come to kind of love myself and mm. accept myself and be comfortable within my skin. Yeah, that's powerful. You know, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think this is an important conversation to have because, you know, here you are, you know, in uh, in LA, in Hollywood, um, working with some, you know, big brands in, in the modeling scene. And, you know, what some people, you know, because a, a lot of our society puts celebrity on a pedestal, um and along comes with that is the this idea that there must be confidence along there with it i remember listening to jake humphrey's high performance podcast and he had johnny wilkinson on and johnny wilkinson was talking about when he was the best rugby player in the world he was at his most mentally unhealthy because mm. he had a level of obsession with his performance with his training and he was internally in his heart, his mind, his spirit, he was he was unwell. And I think that's just a wake-up call to so many people to be careful not to 
you know, look externally, look to people and places for this, this understanding that, you know, everyone's got it all figured out. Everyone's got it all together. Because when you make that assumption that everybody else has got it all figured out, the question is, well, why haven't I? Exactly. Yeah. And it was, and this is something that I say, and, you know, in terms of what I do to campaigning, especially for young men is that I had a lot of young men from around the world messaging me on Instagram saying, I wish I had your life. I wish I, I wish right. I looked. Like yeah. And I was like, you know, from the outside, yeah, you could look at my social media and yes, I'm in, you know, I'm posting photos of me on a beach in the Maldives and, you know, the next day I'm in Bali or something like that. Um, but, you know, to your point, you know, what you see and what looks perfect, nine times out of 10 is not the reality of it. Um, and that's, I try to make a, an important message now to say, you know, you wanted to look like me. Well, actually, there was 20 other people that I wanted to look like on that day. So, and, you know, we're just in this vicious cycle mm. um, of, of pursuing unattainable happiness. Mm. There's this old phrase that says, don't meet your heroes. And I've been fortunate enough, I've met a number of my heroes, and they've actually been decent human beings. But what is, you know, is there an ugly side to this, this culture that you've been part of? <laughs> uh, it's funny when you say don't meet your heroes. I mean, I, I won't name names, but I remember working on a, on a movie 2016, I think it was, in the summer of 2016. Um, and this guy, he, he he's a huge director, and he had directed one of my favorite movies. Um, and I was so excited to, to work with him. And we got on the set and we were filming and <laughs> he just completely was not what I expected. He, 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 was, a, he was an asshole um, and he was really shouting and he shouted at me and I was like, yeah, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is the worst thing ever because I love this movie so much that he, he directed like back in the 90s. Mm. And he's an asshole um so yeah i i mean it is funny when when they say don't meet your heroes but then you know again as you said ryan you know i've met i've met people who i aspired and role models who have turned out to be completely everything and more that i expected you know i met you know one of my biggest role models was paul walker um and i got to meet him before, you know literally a couple of months before he died and you know from that you know, that's that's almost kind of how I got the audition for Fast and Furious. It was um, kind of just through through following his career and getting to meet him and meeting his team and things like that. So, you know, he was amazing. But there is a there is a darker side to the industry. Um, I think a lot of it. Everybody feels as though they have to keep up with the Joneses as such. Sure. Um, again, I'm, I've been very lucky because I try not to go down those roads um you know a lot of people that I was hanging out with they were going out partying they were drinking a lot because they felt as though they had to be in that scene right. and to meet people um so then they were going and you know they would go out and you know there was a lot of drugs um being involved so there is a there is a darker side to it um money plays a big part in it you know people will do a lot for money um I've never been, you know, I, I, you know, there have been times in my life, in my career, where I've always almost been swayed, but, you know, I have a good moral compass. Mm -hmm. That's something that my parents have instilled in me. So mm -hmm. I've never actually gone down, gone down those roads, but definitely, you know, if you're, if you're coming into this industry, um, you really have to have your wits about you because it can be, it can be very persuasive. Mm. You're at a point now where you're you know sharing all of your your learning around well-being, you know, coaching, consulting with people, with with the teams and organizations. You know, how have you packaged your experiences and bottled them up in ways that you can now practically help other people with their well-being? Yeah, it's uh I I don't know whether I try to oversimplify it, but at the end of the day, it's about people. I have worked with all walks of life um, about well-being 
trying to get the message of well-being. And it's just about being a better human, um, how we can be a better human to look after ourselves, but also look after others. Um, I always say, you know, as part of what we do and you know how we sell our services i am not an expert in these things i am not a qualified personal trainer i am not a qualified nutritionist i'm not a psychologist um all of this stuff is from my own personal experience my, my experience and also our team's experience yeah. and we back that up by working with those experts so they'll fact check us mm. um, but a lot of what we sell is based on our experience and how it has helped us and what we have found is that people invest in people that I don't need to know everything in the textbook about well-being or about nutrition. But if I can come across as passionate about it and really wanting to inflict change for the better, mm. people want that rather yeah. than somebody coming in and who has studied it for five years. Again, you know, no yeah. offense to those people because yeah. they they know their stuff, but they haven't lived it as such. They've, mm. they've just read it and studied it. So we take the lived experience and that, that theory yeah. and science and we put them together. And that is the perfect blend to go out to people to say, well-being is everything. Everything that we do is about well-being and people. And it is not just about fitness. Being healthy is not about what you eat. It's how you live. It is literally everything that you do with a company. You want to recruit new people. You don't have just a recruitment strategy. It has to be a well-being strategy too. What is it that you're doing for your people that is going to attract that new talent? Retention. You don't just have a retention strategy. It's a well-being strategy too. What are you doing with your people in the company making them feel how do you value them that is going to retain them so it's about just changing the mindset of individuals companies schools to say well-being isn't this isn't this like hospitality catering thing that we're going to offer to you it is literally in the fabric it is in our dna and that's what we try to educate people on Mm, yeah, it's powerful. And, and I think, you know, just to pick up on what you said around, you know, that lived experience, people forget that they are the most significant data point. Mm. You know, pe people that look to the journals, that look for the science, that look for the evidence, they forget that actually, sometimes there's no such thing as the perfect average. So why would we expect, uh, you know, research to, you know, generic research that applies to an entire population? Why would we expect that to be any better than our own lived experience so i think you know any any good people like yourself sometimes it becomes about influence uh implementation because i think if people were honest with themselves they'd know three four five things that they could be doing that they're not doing already most people know inherently you know some of yeah. the fundamentals that they're not doing so you know Good people like ourselves are just that insp inspiration is probably the wrong word, but just that influence and a bit of accountability to say, go do it, see if it helps. And if it helps, keep doing it. Exactly. And I think, you know, yeah, you're right. We are the accountability. And we're also that that voice, that, that little man on the shoulder yeah. who is reminding them. Because a lot of what I say when I when I, when we coach individuals. We always say, you know, I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs. Yeah. This is all common sense. We know this, but we're going to remind you to keep doing it because I think we, we're we really good as, as people that we can attain information, mm -hmm. but then it gets compartmentalized and it's at the back of our heads mm -hmm. and you need somebody who's going to hold you accountable and is going to be that person on your shoulder to say, what are you going to do about this today? Yeah, you know, many people in workplaces, they're using their work calendars like Tetris. They like see every little box as an area to fill. How might, you know, some people start to fill their calendar with things that might help their well-being? Um, one of the things I always recommend to people, um, like I said earlier in, the, in our chat, 
I'm huge on journaling. I, I love writing down my thoughts. I've been doing it for years now. Um, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people, I don't really like to share sort of what's going on in my head. And I know that can seem a, a little bit hypocritical to kind of what I'm trying to do as a, a sort of a working thing, but I like to write things down. So mm -hmm. a lot of people, we now work virtual, right? So we're all working and we, you know, whether we have that Teams or we use our calendar or, um, you know, whatever, we, we have some sort of chat messaging people with our colleagues. What is the great thing about that is that most of those features, you have a chat to yourself. And so many people I've had is say to me, like, what is the point of this, this chat to myself? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, use that to journal, use that to hold yourself accountable to things, use that to write down exactly how you're feeling. You know, if you don't feel comfortable writing with a pen and paper, writing down your thoughts, use that chat, because then you're already in the rhythm of using and typing to other people. Mm -hmm. Just use it and write it to yourself, write down whatever you want to mm -hmm. do or feel. And what I say to people is, do that every day write down your thoughts every day and if you start to see the same thoughts three days in a row mm. an issue then that is your call to action to speak to somebody because yeah. that's been playing on your mind too much yeah. um so i think that's the first step in terms of trying to get good mental well-being is to see what those patterns are in your thought process and then use that as your evidence because nowadays a lot of we, we're very data driven we're, we're very evidence-based mm -hmm. well actually i've got this this feeling I, i've wrote down i don't feel so great today three times in a row that is your data to then go to somebody and say yeah i think i need to speak with you about this yeah. um so that that's the first suggestion or piece of advice i would give to anybody yeah you know i i relate to the um they're not necessarily sharing a great deal and and, and i guess the my uh, my thoughts and reflections as you spoke was that um the goal isn't always to share the goal is to understand the the, mm. all, the goal is to be able to be self-aware enough to understand what i'm feeling what i'm thinking that it's actually in and around and through me not you know not necessarily i am my thoughts or my feelings but having an awareness of them and um, then being able to use that as a feedback loop to just go and do something that helps or improves that situation. And sometimes that might be talking with other, other human beings. I, um, I spoke with a guy called John Gray, who's the author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And he shared a highly controversial thought, which is that men shouldn't talk about their feelings to other people. <laughs> and the reason he said that is in, in his understanding of you know psychology is that men at their core are problem solvers and if they start applying problem solving to their emotions they'll soon realize that emotions aren't problems to be solved mm -hmm. and then if they can't solve those problems they'll end up concluding that something's broken and that that's usually them so he says actually if men spend time with other men in, in their company actually they'll realize that those emotions come and go but you're absolutely right there's a bit there that says if something keeps coming up then it needs to be shared. It needs to be talked about. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's really interesting because we do, you know, and this is something that I, I walk a very fine tightrope with when we talk about sort of men's men's health and men's mental health and yeah. trying to encourage men to talk because, yeah. you know, I myself, I, I'm i not a sharer. I don't like to talk about what's going on in my head because I, in my head, I feel like I've I can sort it out, which I feel right. like a lot of men can relate to. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm always very reluctant to force people to talk about it because not everybody wants to. So I think, you know, there's almost a change in narrative to say, if you want to talk, there are people here to listen. Yeah. Don't feel like you have to talk yeah. because everybody has their own ways of dealing with things. And mm -hmm. I think, again, you know, whether that is writing things down and, and trying to problem solve it what is the resolution for this yeah. um you know or people some people just like to know that there is somebody there 
and has their back if they need it. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm totally with you that, you know, I, I don't feel, I don't think that we should be encouraging people to talk if they don't want to. We shouldn't be saying all men should talk about their feelings. It's more about just that awareness and, you know, I got your back if you do want to, if you do right. want to share. Yeah, and, and, you know, and I think as this world starts to evolve, I think there will be subtle nuances to kind of therapeutical advice because I think that will look different. You know, I, I've just finished and concluded a, a six-week program with fathers, you know, men. And I can tell you that the conversations that we've had as men has been very different than the mastermind that I run, which is 80%, 90% women. The mm. types of conversations are similar at their core, which is about, you know, where are you at? What are you struggling with? How can we help? But the nature of those conversations is very different. The expression during those conversations are very different. And yet at the end of those conversations, the, all of the men have gone, men don't seem to have these conversations. And I feel lighter for it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't sit around talking about how we're feeling. We were talking about our problems, you know, yeah. a bit more practical, a bit more kind of uh, logical, practical uh, and yet in hearing the views and the opinions of other people, someone can go, oh, I'm glad I'm not on my own. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. It is, yes. You know, sometimes things can be so offloading when you're not intending them to be. Mm. Yeah. What's the, um, what's the thing on your heart and mind for the next, next year with, with all that you're doing in the, in the workspace? Yeah, you know, it's just, uh, you know, we I've been very lucky that this year starting off the business has has really been great. You know, we've grown, we've grown, grown hugely and we've got the recognition um, from our peers, from the industry, which is really validating um, in such a short space of time that we've been running. So that's great. And it's now to just continue on this journey, making sure that we're making meaningful impact to people. Um, so one of the biggest things on my heart at the moment is I'm working on an initiative um, with a great company called the Global Equality Collective um, around body image in young people. It's something that's very close to my heart. Um, and we, we did a lot of research this year. We put out a survey to, um, to the world it was anonymous. We got over a thousand responses from 63 different countries, all from young people telling and sharing their experiences about body image. And now moving into the new year, the hope is, and hopefully we'll be able to create a, a TV documentary series from that. I want to combine all of my passions together, passions about well-being, passions about helping young people. And I'm still very passionate about working in sort of the entertainment industry. Um, so we want to put all of those different silos and all those pieces of who I am together and, and put something out which is really meaningful. So that's something I'm, I'm super excited about because I think, you know, it is going to make a, a great positive change. We just need to work through and make sure we're delivering it in the right way and what our messages are. So that is what is on my heart at the moment. Um, just continuing with the business, just making sure that more people understand well-being as a holistic overall thing rather than just this nice to have. Um, and then, yeah, you know, still, as I said, I, I still love acting and modeling and working in that space. So still auditioning and, and going to castings and just continuing what I do. I love to be busy. Um, you know, the, the past few weeks have been extremely busy, but I like it like that. Um, so I'm just hoping, you know, we continue the pace and yeah. I'm, I'm not a planner, never have been starting a business. It's something that I've really struggled. Everyone's like, you got a plan. Um, and I'm, I'm very spontaneous in that. So um, we'll see what life throws and I will just follow my gut as I've always have. Exciting. I'm excited to see. Um, on the topic of body, um, I'm in the process of listening to uh, David Goggins on the Joe Rogan podcast and David Goggins is extremely honest with himself and a lot of what he talks about his past he calls himself fat 
there's a lot of swear words in and amongst his description of that, as if, if anybody knows, right? He's, you know, but um, one of the things he says that as a society, we're just not honest with ourselves and, and, and are not honest with each other around. And, and this, this is causing a, a lot of underlying shame and, and lack of action. And, um, you know, and, and it, it's quite a, a sensitive subject for many. But what is some of the best ways with which we can approach the subject of, of body issues, particularly if there's someone that we love that's struggling, um, you know, as, as a parent or as a friend, you know, what, what advice would you have for someone in um, who, who loves and cares for someone that's struggling with body image? Yeah, I always, one of the things I've always tried to advise people is to not comment too much on people's appearance mm -hmm. so let's say you know somebody has lost a load of weight and then by by saying wow you look so great now that you've lost all that weight you know the intention is good I totally get it you know it, it's so easy to say wow you look amazing but actually there are some people who will think and and I was guilty of one of them you know when I when I I wasn't a fat kid, but I had, you know, I was overweight. Um, and then when I started to lose weight, people would say, wow, you look so good. And that gave me a trigger to continue losing that weight. And I spiraled into having an eating disorder. Um, so I think we just need to be a little bit more mindful, which is hard because, you know, it, it's one of those things I say, we need to be a bit more mindful. But then there's so many things out there where we almost have to be mindful about and you know I don't want us as a society to get into a position where conversation has to be very calculated right. everything should come very natural but I think if there is somebody that you care about that is struggling with their body image the first question you should be asking them is are you happy you know what is on your mind what what are you feeling what are you not happy about and taking the conversation from there. I can't give specific advice because every mm -hmm. individual is different. Every conversation is different. But I think if you can start with how people feel inside, then you can start to kind of see where, where that emotion or where those feelings are coming from. And then move that in a way that you're pointing them in the direction of support. Yeah. And, and, you know, the likes of uh, the research of Gabo Mate, a lot of it, he, he'll say, is, is stored in, in trauma. So having a bit more of a compassionate approach to, to anybody that's struggling with, there's some potentially some trauma there. And I think that same goes to people who end up going to the gym and getting huge. You know, sometimes that that is a almost a, a response to, but yet we, we don't necessarily make that connection because we believe strong body strong mind and actually some of the some of the most strong physical people are probably the most hardened emotionally oh exactly you know everything you know I, I've also been that guy that was in the gym all the time and really caring about what I look like and making sure that I was so strict with my diet and that isn't healthy in itself yeah. you know anything to excess is is not good and you know you it is just about approaching people in a way that isn't going to put them on the back foot and make them on the defensive. It's about trying to understand, as you said earlier, you know, it's about just trying to understand people. I have a word here, always better than yesterday. It's called heart print. And the word is used to describe the legacy of our interactions that we have with people. What do you, um, let's say that you go out into the world and you do this TV show, you do this documentary series. What do you hope the heart print of your projects will be? that you know yeah people always ask me what is the what is the thing you want to leave behind i think just to make people a bit more kinder to themselves to love themselves to see to see past their flaws and to just be comfortable in their own skin mm. i think that that is the heart print that i want to leave behind i think we you know, as, as great as we're always taught to kind of look after other people and kind of love thy neighbor and, you know, make sure that you're looking out for one, one another. But also it comes back to that analogy. And, you know, I, I hate to use this one because it's so overused, but, you know, you can't, 
you know, you have to put your own seatbelt on, you know, yeah. put your own oxygen mask on before you yeah. look after yeah. others. Yeah. Um, I hate that analogy. I need to find a better one, but um, it is so true. It, it's so true. You know, you, yeah. you can't be in a position to love in a way that is pure and true to other people if yeah. you don't love yourself. Yeah, and I guess the the love thy neighbor, the the finishing off that sentence is as yourself. You know, mm. love thy neighbor as you love yeah. yourself. And you know, I think so many people will understand love as a conditional thing. They've come to the world and there's some form of conditional whether you love me for what I do, you love me for what I look like, you love me for, you know, my achievements and so why why are we then surprised when people then apply that sort of conditions to themselves you know too many people are loving themselves in a conditional way and um yeah i think you just use like it's used to use the words pure or there was there was yeah, something no. yeah there's something pure about that unconditional love that if we can then channel absolutely that's where uh that's where we can really shine a light mm. and it will just you know the moment that you can feel comfortable with who you are and, and really love yourself you can just give so much so much more mm. yeah i've i've said before if you can't give what you've not got imagine how much you can give when you've got a lot totally i love that i've got a, i've got an analogy right you're on a different story this might not fit with your whole kind of like yeah. <laughs> but my we we ordered dominoes a few months ago and my just came in my daughter she's seven she was literally like over this she was hungry it was almost like slapping hands away i said can i have a piece she's like no anyway she continues to eat gets to a point where she's had enough she's like here you go dad <laughs> and it's like it's so funny isn't it we 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 can't get to that spirit of giving freely if somehow we feel like we lack in some way if mm. we lack some of our basic provision our heart kind of closes a little bit because it's almost motivated by lack or i need i need to sort myself out first and i guess that's kind of what it means by well-being isn't it once we give to ourselves first it's not selfish it's just it's not me, but it's not me or you. It's in giving to me first. I then can give more freely to you. Totally. You hit the nail on the head. That is exactly how it is. And, you know, it's the same, you know, well-being is about making sure that I look after myself so I can give 110% out to the yeah, world. Yeah. And it's really interesting because if you think about the spirit of people who are without all their basic needs, you know, we're talking about their leaders, their managers, their parents, their friends, they're in communities, their road rage incidents, you know, these are all fruits of the spirit of people who haven't actually looked after their well-being. Exactly. Exactly. And again, I think people are just so people say, see well-being as like this, this thing that's here. It is, it is the food that I eat. It is it is going to the gym, but it, it's so much more than that. It is like I said, well being is just runs through our body. Yeah, Tommy, I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for the wonderful things you do in the world. Where can people connect with you? Yeah, you can connect with me on social media. So uh, my personal accounts on all platforms is Tommy Hatto, um, or business account is Tommy Hatto Online. Um, or visit the website tommyhatto.com. Love that. I'll share all the good links in the show notes. Be honoured if you'd leave us a final thought from your good self. Yeah, uh, final thought. Hmm. Yeah. Just know the, the light that you hold. Um, there are going to be so many people out there that you'll compare yourselves to, but just know that, yes, you don't have what they have, but they don't have what you have and that is your gift love it my friend thank you so much thank you so much ryan thank you for making it to the end of the interview here on youtube i hope that our time spent together has left you a little bit better than before you push play before you go anywhere please leave a comment down below some of your key reflections your key takeaways i love hearing from you and what this conversation has inspired in you let me know what you're going to do as a result of this conversation I will be back next Wednesday where I will share another inspiring guest. To make sure that you don't miss that, please do subscribe. 
hit the bell and you will be notified as soon as it goes live. If you're curious to know how I, through Always Better Than Yesterday, can serve you, your team, your organisation, please do visit alwaysbetterthanyesterday.com and it will be my honour and privilege to help you in any way I can. Keep leading, my friends. I've been Ryan Hartley, host of the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast here on YouTube. Always love.